Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you most likely have heard, or if you haven't heard, what we're about at the Beacon Fight for Life is reconnecting the Australian multicultural community. Our main goal is to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life in Australia. Currently, suicide is the leading cause of death of all Australians 15 to 44 for men. Uh, Indigenous people are three times likely to take their own life, and, and it's sad to say that 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. So the Beacon Fight for Life, we want to reduce the number of people taking their own life and so what we're going, to, we're going to play over the coming months is some footage of conversations I've had with individuals, groups, multicultural, you name it, I'll interview them so that we can start to make inroads for people um, to stop them from taking their own life. Give them information and places to reach out to. So stay tuned. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Ema Quigley, who's a clinical psychologist and a lecturer at Edith Cowan University. She is the director of the Psychology Training Clinic, where postgraduate psychology students complete their first placement. She lectures in the areas of mental health assessment and skills training, which includes assessment of suicide and self-harm. Ema has worked in medical health area for 20 years and, a clinic, and as a clinical psychologist for the past 13 years. She's worked across government, not-for-profit and private industries in Perth and in the Kimberley regions of Western Australia. Ema's passion is supporting people who are suffering and she uses her superpowers and her skills and knowledge to improve the well-being of as many people as possible. She believes in the power of connection as the antidote to suffering. Ema, thank you for letting me interview you today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to do so. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank and you. And I must say thank you to start with because spending 20 years in the mental health arena, industry, um, people around you and your, in your local community must, must be um, seeing the benefits of that. So thank you. Thank you. Do you mind if we get straight into it? Yeah, great. So basically what we're going to do today is we're going to just to talk about the the basics of psychology from a professional angle. Because as they know, I want to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life um, by suicide. And so I want to go, go back to basics and ask some questions and get the answers from your email with your wealth of knowledge. So we'll get started. What is the difference between suicide and self-harm? So when we think about suicide and self-harm, the main difference is intent. So if a person has the intention to die, then by hurting themselves in some way, then we call that a suicide attempt. Okay. Whereas if a person doesn't have the intent to die, but they hurt themselves in some way, then we call that a self-harm attempt. Okay. What are some ways that we can talk respectfully about suicide? Yeah. So there's certain terms that we are trying to bring into um, the common language, mm -hmm. um, saying things like die by suicide rather okay. than committed suicide. Sometimes if we say committed suicide, it might um, evoke ideas of it, that it's, it's a criminal thing or if it's, it's sinful, that there's a, it's really um, horrible connotations to it. Um, so, yeah, we, we just we want to be respectful in um, how we speak about suicide. Well, saying that, do you think the way we talk about suicide is causing more of a stigma? Um, I think sometimes if we're saying things like committed suicide, mm. successful suicide, it does add to the stigma um, that's associated with suicide. So rather than saying something like successful suicide, which might then indicate that that was the person's desire, uh, we might say something like died by suicide. Okay. How common is suicide across the world? So sadly, about 800,000 people take their lives mm -hmm. every year, which is phenomenal. And if you actually break that down, that's one person every 40 seconds. So we've been talking for a few minutes now. Mm -hmm. So in that time, quite a few people have ended their lives. Wow. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that have you know, attempted suicide at the same time. Yeah. Which is rather sad. How many people each year die by suicide in Australia? Australia has quite a high rate of suicide. About uh, in 2019, uh, over 3,300 people took their lives by suicide. Mm. So that's quite a significant number. 
Just to put it into perspective, Derek, that's about three times the number of people that die on our roads every year in Australia. Wow. Mm. How many people in WA suicide? Yeah, so uh, the statistics again for last year, it was over 400 people in Western Australia died by so suicide. One and a half or something a day is... Yeah, it's more than, yeah, it's well more than one a day, yeah. What age groups are the most at risk? So one of the vulnerable age groups is between 30 and 59. Mm. So what we know is that more than half of suicides last year were within that age range. So very vulnerable group aged between 30 and 59. Wow. One of our other um, critical periods is with younger people. So between the ages of 15 and 24, over one third of the deaths were caused by suicide. When you look at the, all of the different ways that somebody could die. So that'll put youth at risk as well, yeah. high risk. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, being a psychologist, you must do a ton of research or read a ton of research. What does the research tell you about suicide? There's a lot of research on what we call suicidality, so um, suicidal thoughts, suicidal behaviour, suicide attempts. And if I was to summarise all the research so that people can actually connect with it, what we do know that is if a person is feeling very alone, if a person is feeling that they're a burden to others, if they're feeling hopeless and if they're feeling helpless and they have access to means, then they're at most risk of uh, attempting suicide. Which leads me to my next question. What are some of the signs we can look for in others that may increase the possibility of them having suicidal thoughts? Yeah, so there's really three areas that I think are important to look for, mm -hmm. thinking, feeling and relating. So if we look at thinking, if you're noticing that somebody's thought process is really narrow, is really constricted, okay. uh, their idea is um, this is it, all that I've got is um, to end my life, they don't see any other options, that's a really constricted viewpoint. If you look at somebody's feelings, if they're feeling hopeless and helpless, like I said earlier, mm. then that's a real indicator that we want to get in and try, try and off, offer some support of some kind. Mm. And the third part that I mentioned is relating. So within their relationships, if we know that they have recently lost somebody very uh, dear to them, if they've had a recent relationship breakdown that significantly impacted them, that can increase their sense of feeling alone, mm. that can increase their sense of burden on others. So again, like I was saying with the theories, we know that that can um, increase their risk. Now, are there particular times in the year that we should be more focused or you know, concerned about people? Yeah, so that's a really individual question. So if we know somebody well, uh, we want to look at anniversary dates for them. Okay. So for example, if somebody... Um, somebody lost their spouse this year and we're coming up to the end of the year, we know that this Christmas will be the first Christmas without their spouse. So that could be really difficult for them. Uh, if we know when uh, a loved one's birthday is, if it's the first birthday or if it's an anniversary birthday. So it's quite an individual thing as to what part of the year we might be looking at for our friends a little bit more. Okay. What, are the, what, what would you say is the most important warning sign for us to look out for. Yeah, so there's an idea that we call the tipping point. Mm -hmm. So somebody can have a lot of risk factors, a lot of things um, that are increasing their um, their risk of, of hurting themselves. Uh, and a very significant event uh, would be called a tipping point. So something mm -hmm. like a significant relationship breakdown, a death of a loved one, loss of a job if work is really important to them and they've been in a job for a long time. So depending on the individual, uh, what we notice is, is this tipping point where everything kind of caves in and gets really, really hard. Yeah, they've just had enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What risk factors are most important to be aware of? Yeah, so I tend to um, break risk factors up into three different areas. Mm -hmm. So we've got the individual ones, we've got the social ones, and we've got the contextual ones. Okay. So I'll go through those each um, uh, one at a time. So uh, risk factors for an individual would be things like gender. So we know that being male, sadly, increases your risk of um, ending your life. 
um, people in the LGBTIQ plus community, for example, uh, have a higher rate of suicide than other groups. Uh, so a person's individual set of um, circumstances can impact on their risk. Okay. The second one is social. So if we've got family violence, if we've got family conflict, um, bereavement, um, family breakdowns, separations, then that can be uh, something that can increase the risk for a person. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is context. So if somebody is unemployed, is homeless, uh, lacks social um, a social group, that can increase uh, the risk. But what's important there, Derek, is to keep in mind um, somebody can have all of these risks, but not be a risk of suicide. So it's really, it's not an exact science at all. These are things that we will weigh up uh, when we're thinking about somebody and that point in time for them as to whether these things are impacting on them in the moment. So would you say it's because they cope better with pressure? Uh, and is that, is that across the board? So you would be less worried about that person? It depends because some people can present very well I'm sure that you've come across many people mm. that on the face of it seem to be doing quite well. And then you might start a conversation where you share something vulnerable and then they actually uh, come back and, and start opening up. Exactly. So it's really hard to tell, particularly in today's society where we're kind of told to chin up, look a certain way, everything's fine. Yeah. What are some factors that could prevent a person from attempting to take that yeah, so just like I went through the different risk factors, we also have the opposite, what we call protective factors. Mm -hmm. So again, individual, social and contextual. Mm -hmm. So individually, if um, a person has a meaningful purpose in life, uh, if they're of the female gender, um, they are less uh, at risk of uh, ending their life by suicide. Uh, with the social context, if somebody um, has good family support, good social network, they're going to be uh, that protective uh, of them having suicidal thoughts. And then contextually, if somebody uh, has a stable job, lives in a safe neighbourhood, those kind of things, that's going to be a protective uh, against um, trying to end their lives. Okay. Just go back on that, For you say females are less at risk, is that because of the research or the, the, the statistics that say that you know 75 to 78 percent of men and the rest of women is that where you get that from yeah so because about three quarters of suicides are male mm. a quarter are female so sadly that's just, that's just it's statistically yeah do you, do you know why that could be there's two kinds of schools of thought mm. uh with why men the male rate of suicide is higher, significantly higher than the female rate of suicide. One is uh, what I was talking about earlier with the theories of suicide. So could it be that men today feel more alone, feel more of a burden, feel more hopeless, feel more helpless wow. than women? Okay. Or when we look at the, the second part is when we look at the way that Pe the the uh, methods that people choose to end their own lives, uh, what we know that is that men tend to choose more lethal means than women do. So their their chance if they attempt their chance of completing is going to be higher. And so you know last year, sixty percent of deaths by suicide in men were by hanging whereas that was only 50% for, for women. Um, and, for example, firearms was about 7% for men and less than 1% for women. So, uh, sadly, with the more lethal, you know, it's it's just that, that one time, um, there's there's no going back from those. So, yeah. Well, it sounds, it sounds pretty complicated. Is there any way that we know if someone will attempt suicide based on risk and protective factors? So... It is absolutely complicated and it's very much individual and it's very much time specific. So uh, that's where I always encourage people that if they have a significant concern for somebody, even if they've been to the emergency department the previous week and had an assessment that says, no, they're okay, that can change really quickly. And so as, as a um, health professional, 
whenever we do assessments, we base it on that point in time only. Mm. What would a person expect to happen if they did have a medical professional assess their level of risk? Yeah, so there's a lot of different questions that will be asked of them mm -hmm. if they were having a suicide risk assessment by a medical professional. So they will ask about their current thoughts or feelings about ending their life. They would be asked if they've had any past attempts, if they've had any past times where they felt uh, and had thoughts of ending their life. And uh, they'll be asked, normally asked if they have a plan of what they're going to do and then um, go into detail on the specifics of that. Just so as a professional, we can get an idea of the severity of what's happening for that person. Now, on the other side, uh, when we do an assessment, we try to balance it up with some of those protective factors. Mm -hmm. So we might ask questions uh, to see if they're open to other options. So to see if there's that narrow, uh, narrow thinking or if they're more uh, open. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we might ask questions about um, their social supports. Uh, so if there are people in their lives, so there's a sense of belonging, they're not feeling so alone, um, they're not feeling uh, a burden that they can talk to others. So that could be protective. And then we also might ask about future events. That can be a double-edged sword. Sometimes future events can be something that can be protective. So if somebody has something they're looking forward to, oh yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to this event and um, th that would lift uh, their mood somewhat and might um, decrease their risk. Or, as I mentioned earlier, if somebody is um, going uh, into Christmas alone, they've recently separated, this is their first Christmas by themselves, that could be exceptionally difficult. So yeah. future events can be a risk or can be a protective factor. Okay. If there's someone wanting to seek professional help, how do they get started? Yeah, the first point of call is your GP. So going to talk to a general practitioner, um, they are trained in doing a brief mental health assessment and they can do what's called a mental health care plan. Okay. So what happens there is they spend a little bit longer with the person. It's a little bit of a, of a longer consultation. And they again, they go through a lot of questions. Mm. But what can come out of that is a referral to a psychologist. Okay. And that's a Medicare um, system. So it's free. Uh, yeah, so it's partly um, funded by Medicare, okay. and then private psychologists will charge some kind of a gap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then the person can, the GP will know in the local area what psychologists are available, uh, who deals with particular things, so they can refer them directly to a psychologist. Okay. Do you think I've missed anything? I mean, we're just going over the basics for you know, people understanding if they what it would be like to see a psychologist, why they might want to see a psychologist. Have we missed anything? I think what's important to know is the majority of people that are feeling suicidal are ambivalent. So there is that sense of this seems like my only option, but I don't want to do it. So that's the, the edge that we want to kind of intervene at. And we want to balance them over the other side of why you wouldn't want to do it, what you've got to live for, um, and trying to help them engage in, uh, I guess, intervention. If they're going through a depressive episode, if they're highly anxious to treat that, which can then alleviate and um, help with the suicidal thoughts. What's the success rate of someone that has seen a psychologist and someone that hasn't? Do we, is there such a... a I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how we would measure that. I suppose um, research would have to look at um, people that have ended their life by suicide and whether they had That's seen a cycle, yeah. So, Ema, before we wrap it up, do you mind if I ask, in your professional um, career, how satisfying has it been to watch people turn around from coming out of a dark space? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. Um, and obviously, without going into details to maintain confidentiality, there's been quite a few times where people have thanked me for saving their life. And <laughs> um, and that's really humbling. Yeah. Um, people, when they're suicidal, when they try to take their own lives, are in a very, very dark place. And if they engage and trust a psychologist, they 
can improve and they can get through it and then be able to look back on that time as a distant memory and continue living a fulfilling life. Okay. All right, well, again, thank you for the work you, you do in your community and around mental health. Um, I appreciate that and I'm sure the community do as well. Um, so my takeaway from, from all of this content would be if you know someone or if you're watching this and you're wondering where to now, the first step would be to call your GP and then he can direct you in the right, or he or she can direct you in the right direction. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Ima, for participating, and hopefully we can do this again. Yeah, okay. definitely. Excellent. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.